All right. We uh, embark on something I'm very passionate about this morning, and that is um, critical thinking. Um, every year in the spring, uh, the Jews celebrate something called the Passover. Around the world, it's, it's celebrated eight days. Um, in Jerusalem, it's six days. And uh, the very first night, the very first, the Passover Seder, the youngest child is usually the one who asks the questions. What makes this night different than any other night? But then there are four questions that the youngest child is supposed to ask um, during the Mishnah. Um, number one, why are we eating matzah? Uh, number two, why are we eating the bitter herb, the maror? The answer to the matzah is because, hey, we celebrate the Passover because they were fleeing from Egypt and they didn't have time for the bread to rise. And so the matzah is, is symbolic of the non-leavened, unleavened bread. Maror, the bitter herb, because their lives were, their lives were bitter. Um, why, do we, why do we eat the meat that is roasted? Uh, because that was the way they cooked it when they were in their wanderings. And the fourth question, um, why, do we, why do we dip the food uh, twice? Now, there's tons of interpretations as to why they ask these four questions. Why do they have the cup for Elijah? Why do they have the six different you know, pieces um, set on the plate? But one of the things that I really enjoy about the Jewish celebration of the Passover, the Pesach, is um, it encourages questions. It encourages them to ask, inquire. It's something I wasn't, uh, quite frankly, allowed as a child. Um, my brothers and I got in trouble asking questions in the mosque uh, when things seemed somewhat inconsistent. Sadly, we are right now in a period of time where that's uh, de rigueur. You're not supposed to ask questions. You're supposed to obey. Think about it. It's a very different setup than, say, in the 60s and the 70s when the cultural revolution was, we're going to question everything, question authority, question everything. We won't follow your rules, right? Now, in the 2020s, you have to follow our rules. And if you don't follow our rules, and if you don't surrender, we will cancel you. We will, you know, we will attack you. And don't ask questions. If you ask questions, you might be banned off of whatever social media. I, I love the encouragement to asking questions. So, if we may, let's begin with one. Is math racist? Look in your notes. Um, February 26th of 2021 in Portland, Oregon, the Oregon Department of Education, the ODE, released a newsletter that went to all the math educators, uh, and it was called The Pathway to Equitable Math Instruction. Its stated thesis was math is rooted in white supremacy and racism. It's an 82-page uh, booklet that suggested that teachers need to find a way to get away from, and I'm going to quote here, the math that is used to uphold capitalist, imperialist, and racist views. So I asked the question, is it possible for math, which is the search for objective and propositional truth, you know, it's computation, it's numbers, quantities, shapes in some cases. Math is, is a science. Is math possibly racist? Is two plus two somehow, is it racist to say that that's four? Um, one of the biggest influences in my life, I make note, is Dr. Norman Geisler. Dr. Geisler used to say, everybody has a right to their opinion, but you don't have a right to your own facts. Facts are facts. Somehow we've gotten away from this. With reference to the question of math, answers are dictated by the computation of numbers. Signs and formulas are clearly established, and they're reproducible. They're testable. Everybody should get the same answer because it's logic and science. Is it possible that a bias can enter into the world of math? And yes, by the way, it is possible in two ways. Is it possible for the math to become racist? Sure. In word problems, um, and again, I give a citation. What if I said, Bill bought three wives in, in a word problem, and each wife cost, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's offensive. 
number one, who are you to buy anybody? And number two, how do you have multiple wives? Um, we're in a monogamous culture based on scripture. So that can be offensive. But, but furthermore, the interpretation of fact, or say the follow-up, for instance, polls. You poll 100 people, you may get the same numbers, but you're going to get a different interpretation. And the interpretation can, in fact, be uh, racist. But math itself, propositional, objective, logical, rational, coherent truth. No, it can't be. It's based on fact. But when we get into a culture that's gotten away from fact and has, has sort of descended into feeling, um, I, I make the point, the, the reason for this lecture, it has eternal implications. Christianity is presented in scriptures, logical, rational, intellectual. God doesn't call us to check our brains. You don't take a leap of faith, like Søren Kierkegaard used to say. You don't leap into the darkness. You take a step into the darkness, but it's based on the fact that you know that God is there because God has always been there, and there is reason that leads to faith, faith that expands my reason capacity, my ability to think. I don't believe and then understand. I understand to believe. We continue. The ability to analyze and evaluate any truth claim is a crucial skill to master. Learning these tools, you're going to be able to think historically, mathematically, scientifically, skillfully, and of course, uh, biblically. There's seven facts on page two about the essence of Christian truth. Number one, the Bible is called truth. Thy word is truth, John 17, 17. Two, the Father is truth. Have you not spoken? Won't he make it right? Numbers 23. I am God, and not man, the Holy One in your midst. The triune God acts based on his truth. And I quote from Isaiah 65, that he who blesses himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. He that swears in the earth shall swear by the God of truth. So truth is rooted in the character and nature of God. To question the ability to, to understand truth is to question God. But you take it to God, just like Job did. The Son is truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. The Holy Spirit is truth. He's called the Spirit of truth in John 15. We worship in spirit and truth. The hour cometh, he says to the woman at the well, Samaritan woman at the well. And of course, if God is not truth, then our faith is a fraud. God forbid, yea, let God be true and every man a liar, Romans 3. As it's written, thou might manifest by be justified in thy sayings and might overcome when thou art judged. There are four levels in modern parlance, four levels of faith. There is feeling. It's based on intuition. Sadly, I'd say probably 80% of Americans never get past this. It's gut feeling. I feel. You hear them say this. I feel. Hey, trust your heart. No, don't trust your heart. Jeremiah 17, heart is wicked above all. Don't, no, don't trust your heart. Your heart can deceive you. It's wicked above all. The second level, you go from feeling to thinking. I, you go saying, I think. And we've now gone from feeling to opinion. Everybody thinks. I think my ball team is the best ball team. And here's why. It doesn't make it the best ball team. It doesn't mean it's rooted in truth. It could be. But level three, I believe. When you go from I think to I believe, you're now engaging in an argument, rhetoric, logic, the ability to say, okay, here's why. So I believe my team is the best because we have you know, the best lineup or the most home runs or whatever. But the fourth level of truth, the actual level of truth, is when you go from I feel to I think, I think to I believe, I believe to I know. And all the way, 21 times in 1 John, these things have I written so that you might know. And it's important because we're called to know that we're saved. We're called to know the will of God. But sadly, most people never get to that point. They, they stay in the ethereal. They stay in the feeling, their gut, their intuition. And they never get to the point of understanding things. Notice, Belief 
is the result of knowing. I put my trust in Christ, having considered his claims and having considered his truth. Look at the page three. There's four defining facts. We're talking about critical thinking. We're talking about the essence of being able to analyze, discuss, rationally consider. Truth tells it like it is. Truth corresponds to fake, to facts and, and uh, to reality. It matches an object. You know, a table is a table. A tree is a tree. It's not a cat. And it requires a criteria. Truth has to be testable. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but here's how faith and reason work together. God calls us to use our mind, and I list for you seven, seven, but there's so many more. There's actually 92 verses in the Bible where God calls us to engage our mind. Um, I give a number of them, but I'm going to, for the sake of time, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound noose mind. But notice there's also, we are called to be transformed. I beg you, he says, to be, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There, there's a number of words for mind. Um, one of them I list for you is the honor, uh, capacity to consider, to, to ask the right questions. But noose, the actual mind itself, is where reason and logic spews forth. It's where you have a settled faith, confidence based on what you know and who you know. If God is the God of truth, the more I know him, the more I know truth. Page four. Um, we go back to the days of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and they used to have seven subjects that they studied in every school. I know that you study many more subjects. There's many more majors, but there were three. Now, the four top ones were the mathematics of science, mathematics of astrology, um, astronomy, actually. Um, but then there were three. Grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Those three are called the trivium, the three sides, so to speak. Every person, even in the Middle Ages, during the, the days of uh, Charles the Great, the Carolinian Renaissance, um, they, they studied the three, the trivium. Anybody who is studying to be a lawyer studied the three. Anybody who was studying to go into politics, and that was how Plato, uh, in the dialogues, Plato applied it to the politic, to the republic, to the, the idea that if you were going to represent people and stand for people, that you had to know grammar, which is knowing the right words, logic, which is the mechanics of thought, um, identifying bad arguments and formulating your arguments, and then finally, rhetoric. Rhetoric is the ability to persuade, to argue, to present your case. Grammar is the ability to put together the words, define your terms. Logic, to build your argument. Rhetoric, to persuade. And I, I make the case because it is, in fact, found in Aristotle's writings, but it's also found in our scripture. That Aristotle said there were three ways to persuade. By the way, there are three ways to preach the gospel. There's logos, pathos, and ethos. It's testable, by the way. Logos, the word, the truth, the life. The, the pathos is the passion. It's the communication thereof. The ethos is the application, ethics. So logos, like theology, words about God, philosophy, uh, the idea that I study, I, I put together the ideas, the right questions in my estimation. I, I like the questions. That's grammar. But then I put together my arguments. That's logic. That's building the mechanics, uh, composing sound arguments. The result is, is systematically removing contradictions to uh, produce factual knowledge. Factual knowledge is, is knowledge you can trust because it's consistent. But to stand in the pulpit, to open up the Word of God, you preach the Word, Logos. You sweat. You pour it in. You apply it to Monday. Pathos. 
why I think it's a sin to be boring when you got the Word of God open. And you applying it to Monday is ethos, the, the application. So pathos, the passion. Ethos, the application. All, by Aristotle, but all in Scripture. On the next page, I list for you, and I don't have time to go into these right now, but we will. Uh, the nine logical fallacies, how to spot a lie, how to spot a bad argument. It's not just for debate. It's literally every time somebody comes into your office and any time somebody asks you a question about Scripture and they have a, an issue or, or another position, how do you spot when somebody is using fallacious arguments, when somebody's using terms that we, you know, red herring, uh, begging the question, etc., straw men? That's the nine informal fallacies. I think if you learn those, I believe that you become the better preacher. But the final page that I want to come to is page six, and it's the summary point. Two things that I absolutely believe, based on logic, based on rational thought, and this is where we hearken back to the beginning. Propositional truth, objective, not subjective, testable truth, will give us two things. Number one, you can know reality, Truth about reality is both knowable and objective and undeniable. You cannot deny it. I list for you. Objective truth is deduced through examinations or it's self-evident. We believe these things to be self-evident. Men were created by God. Subjective truth is based on opinion, feeling, regardless of fact. I list for you three laws of logic. The law of identity. Uh, two plus two equals four. God is God. The law of non-contradiction, that's going to be important in the second point. And the law of the excluded middle, when it comes to truth statements, either something is true or it's, or it's false, especially when you deal with eternal things. This, to, to, to disprove the existence of truth is self-defeating. For instance, somebody says, uh, there is no truth. Great. Is that a truth statement? There are no absolutes. And do you absolutely believe that? The second absolute that you can know is that truth about reality is noble and objective and you can't deny it. Another way to say this one is if two conflicting truth statements are presented they are either both false or one is true. Either Christianity is true or Islam is true, but they both can't be true because they have conflicting truth statements. They have absolute contradictory paths to salvation. They don't present their same God, the same salvation, the same book. And so, I come back to the point. If you can know truth, you can also know the lie. And both of them are absolute statements. To make those statements is actually a great way to begin a gospel presentation to somebody who's an intellectual. See you at the next lecture.